Sambonani, Molweni, Poyamadah, good afternoon to all of you. Kamirodi Khais, welcome to this place which is connected to so many other places, both within Cape Town and I suspect even far beyond. But welcome to this place called Kamirodi Khais. This is the name which the original people in this area called what is now observatory. The reference to the stars, which they, this place is called the place of the stars, the reference to the stars is captured in our panelists today. But those original people also referred to Table Mountain as Hurikwaka, the mountain of the sea. They recognized this place as being rich with traditional herbs essential for healing. Today is the reflection of that healing. We recognize the legacy of those first people and recognize them today as ancestors in the healing arts and in the science of discovery of cure. Today marks the first event of the faculty's Pride Month, but we recognize in the origins of Pride as that raunchy declaration of sexuality, which is often characterized by white male and muscular bodies, themselves a symbol of so many contradictions. But essential to our conversation today is in fact the representation of bodies. And as we reconstruct that idea, that it becomes integral to our liberating discourse today. Again, today, this faculty comes to pride with a humility, a humility born out of the reflection of our legacies, sometimes denied, sometimes complex, but deeply rooted in oppression and exclusion. We come to this Pride Month in the faculty in the spirit of Simon Nkoli, who in the 1980s at that first Soweto Pride event, Johannesburg Pride event declared, I am black and I am gay. I cannot separate these two parts of me into primary and secondary struggles. They are all one struggle. But in the same notion of, of recognizing the multiple oppressions that people experience, I'm emboldened by our own Associate Professor Mark Hendricks' comments in an article that he re recently wrote. He speaks about the fact that pride cannot be collectively owned without owning everyone in our community. And in fact, he goes on to say that as a gay man, I am very, and I quote, as a gay man, I'm very proud of my community for the historical and massive current effort locally, nationally, continentally and globally that continues to protect vulnerable queer people, particularly the young woman, young woman, black and trans bodies who still live in fear of physical violence and even death. He declares at the end of, in, as part of his comments, South Africa, you are guilty of that kind of violence. As we begin this idea today, as we begin this conversations today, we acknowledge that we have titled this first web webinar, Nothing About Us Without Us Celebrating Pride. We embark on a conversation as a faculty 
with the marginalized LGBTQIA plus communities. We invite them to this uncurated dialogue, recognizing the need for their full expression and amplification in spaces like our own. We don't know where these conversations lead us or whether we will agree with everything that people say or think or ask of us. But what we do know is that we commit to a journey together of discovering each other and allowing that discovery to play itself out in, in, in a changed environment. Today's seminar then represents for me in the deanery and for us as a faculty, the construction of a collaborative safe space in which we all share responsibility for our contested legacies. I will share the moderation of today's session with Janara Naidu, herself a member of the queer community in, in, at, at our faculty who leads the student group Standing Committee for Reproductive Activism. Janara is a, is a fourth year medical student here in the faculty, a proud member of the queer community and chairperson of SCORA. SCORA hopes to provide a safe space for students to explore and nurture reproductive justice, intersectional feminism, queer inclusive healthcare, and sex work activism in the context of UCT. It's really a, a, an honor for me to be sharing the platform of moderation with a student today, because I do reckon that unless we hear the student's voice profoundly in this conversation, we would be remiss. Three activists will take us on a journey this afternoon, reflecting on our realities, but also challenging our capacity to respond. The next session will be essentially taken in three phases. The first will be a reflection of victimization and the vulnerability societies place on marginalized gender communities. Sharon Cox will present the hate crimes and victimization on LGBTQI plus people. The speaking of victimization on that community. Sharon is, is the health and support services manager at Triangle Project. Part of her role is the support of victims of crime and violence, preparation for court and working closely with the criminal justice cluster. She will be presenting about hate crimes on the LGBTQI plus people. And then we will go into a phase of thinking about research. Thoughts on the research space helping us to think about the right questions to ask in our research and what to do about the answers. Amelia Fiki comes from the key populations research at Grotesque Hospital. She's the community liaison person liaison officer of the Desmond Tutu Key Populations Unit Trials at Curtis Key. She is facilitating 10 safe spaces with different communities and have established that have been established across Cape Town. She has a social, Amelia has a social work background and worked at the TAC for more than 10 years. She will tell us about the work that she's doing. And then finally, we will take a position in this conversation that all social spaces may represent a site of struggle and sometimes particularly the spaces of faith, which have often constructed the frames of exclusion. And so Hansen Davids will present from a, a faith based LGBTI advocacy position. He is the process coordinator at Inclusive and Affirming Ministries, I am. He works there as, as in the Faith Partnerships Program in mainline denominations, universities and seminaries, doing facilitation, research and resource development at the intersection of gender, sexuality and faith. He has authored and co-authored peer review articles and chapters on religion, gender, sexuality, reproductive justice and LGBTQ plus children in heteronormative families. My pronouns are he and him, and I now invite Sharon Cox to present uh, her, her, her contribution today.
perhaps while we're connecting Sharon, let me just say that there's going to be a, a section of Q&A that you can put your questions in. And at the end of the three speakers' contribution, Gennaro will then facilitate the answering of the questions in that space, but um, no number no, nine. Am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. Thank you so much. Are my screens visible? I hate this when people do it in webinars and now I'm doing it. Is my presentation visible? Yes, it is, Sharon. You can just make it um, presenter mode and then you can go ahead. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Sharon Cox. I'm the Health and Support Services Manager at Triangle Project. Um, and a large part of my role at Triangle is um, the monitoring of hate crimes, which also entails preparing um, victims and survivors um, for court and taking people through the process from reporting at times and if it's after the fact then uh, support through the criminal justice system if that's what people choose um, and uh, taking them through to the end of the case and also liaising all the way along with the criminal justice cluster. So the, uh, the content of my presentation is hate crimes and victimization of LGBTQI plus people and the impact of victimization. So um, often people would ask, and I'm sure you are not amongst them, but often people would ask, in a country with such a progressive constitution, um, why then still the high rates that we see of, of victimization Sharon, we've stopped hearing you. Sharon, um, colleagues, uh, Sharon appears to be lost at the moment. What I'm going to do is, is she's probably going to have to leave for a minute and then come back into the seminar. Um, we, we'll wait for her for a couple of minutes and if there's a problem, we'll go on to the next talk. Garth, is that the best route? Hey, yes, Lionel. Um, it seems to me that she has left. Yeah, the meeting and to come back in. I think so, maybe we should move on. And so I tell you what, yeah, I, I would agree with that. So uh, Amelia Fiki is going to present, uh, was due to present after Sharon, but I think it, it goes equally well before Sharon's talk, uh, speaking about the research spaces uh, related to key people's, the key people's unit at Rotoski. Go ahead, please, Amelia. Just unmute. All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amelia Fiki, the Community Liaison Officer at Protest Care Clinical Trials Unit. We are a KPOPS unit. I will be presenting about the work that we are doing. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes go ahead. Can you hear me now? All right, so my background and I'll be presenting about the work that we are doing at GSH. Uh, 
J52 old main. Sure. Shall I continue now? Yeah, I think just indicate to Clint to change the slides when you need to, but we were hearing you clearly. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so the key pops you need runs the Keep going, Amelia. We were hearing you. Sure. So we are the key populations unit at Protestant 52. I'm unmuted. We're hearing you. Go ahead. Um, so we are part of what we are doing. We have. So Amelia, I think you're seeing the mute on Clint's screen. So that's not you that's muted. You're, you're live and we're hearing you. Hello. Uh, Amelia, we're hearing you. Please continue. The, the, the mute button is for Clint who's showing your slides. Oh, all right. Um, so I won't bother about the background of the HIV statistics, but we know that we, as the key population, are the people that are at risk and the numbers are increasing all the day. So can you go to... Yes. Um, so I want you to get to slide number three because um, the research that we are doing is looking at the prevention toolbox. We are trying to add on what is already here, but not working for everyone. We know there is there are different methods for prevention, but now we are talking more of PrEP. And on the next slide, we will be talking about the prevention studies that we are doing with um, research. Can we get to slide number four? The, these are the studies that we are currently doing, um, enrolling participants on at, at, at J52. We, I will go straight to MK024, which is oral PrEP. I'm sure people are informed that we have done the injectable PrEP, which was HPTN 3 and we have done HPTN. So the prevention studies, this slide is showing the prevention studies that we've worked with. Um, these are the recent. Um, we have looked at the antibodies mediated prevention study, which was H10 OH1. And we have done injected prep. And now we are currently enrolling participants in OMK. So I want to get to slide number six. Uh, skip this one. Get to slide number six. So, uh, can you get to, yeah, this one. So on, on the study that we are currently looking at now is giving participants the overall prep fund. You know the injectable prep was uh, a month, and uh, now we are on oral prep, and this is this is a pill. Uh, we are looking at the reasons why we do the studies. We are trying to check the strong drug and the resistance, and we also checking the tolerance and the safety of the drug. The next slide. The next slide, Quentin. The next one. The next slide. 
All right, so the primary objective of the MK024 study is to evaluate the efficacy of oral PrEP in reducing the incidence of HIV. And no, 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 go back to that slide, the previous one. Um, so we are looking at the efficacy of um, oral PrEP in the inclusion criteria. We are looking at the people that are eligible for our study. If a gender, male or trans, female from 16 years up, and if you are HIV negative and have results before, this means we'll continue by doing the test. And if you are sexually active with a male or trans, meaning you are born, and if you are at high risk for sexually acquiring HIV, uh, we're looking at participants that are at high risk sometimes not using condom with multiple partners. How is this study going to work? Once to get on site, we do all the blood, we take blood, we put for session, we screen, make sure that you're eligible for this study. And we we'll give you uh, oral prep once a month. You will be with us for, 20, for two years, but within the two years, we'll visit the site 26 times. Um, this means um, there are times when you call twice a month, there are times when you visit us once a month. And on visit 27 and 28, we are only doing the phone call. So on your visit 26, it's your last time, and then we check. Visit 27, visit 28. Can you go to the next slide? The next slide. So the, the, the previous uh, study that I was talking about was the one that is looking at K-pops or men of sex with men. Women. And we also have the, so we also have the COVID studies where we are looking at participants who uh, tested positive for COVID within five days and have symptoms. Some, even if one has uh, vaccinated, we have studied for those who also have studied for the participants that have not yet went for vaccine. As much as we encourage people to go for vaccine, but there are those that are comfortable saying we don't want the vaccine. So we have studied for people that are yet vaccinated. Um, at the, in summary, we believe that PrEP is full in the fight and the drugs and the class of drugs that are stronger than what we have what we need to look at. We're excited in exploring more choices for the reasons that people are not comfortable or it cannot be a blanket approach. Continue to dream that one day we will be a better decision. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Amelia. I, I, I have to recognize and, and, and thank you for their patience because I recognize that you're speaking from a, quite a far place in terms of the connection. Um, so thanks very much for that contribution. Um, Sharon still is not has not rejoined us, colleagues. So we're going to go ahead with Hanslin's uh, presentation. Hanslin, are you ready to take off? Yes, I am. Uh, let me just make it current slide. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will be speaking from the perspective of a faith-based, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, plus or other um, advocacy standpoint. Uh, thank you for the co-chairs and the organizing uh, panel for the invitation. And also apologies on behalf of my colleague, uh, Nokutula Munchwaha, who has also recently graduated from UCT um, in a, with an honors in, in gender studies. Um, but before I go forward, as a queer theological researcher, one of the things for me um, that is important whenever I do a presentation or do research or preach, we am I allow or we I'm allowed to preach. I position myself um, being cognizant of the fact that um, my positionality 
influences the way that I see um, the world around me and also experience the world around me. So I'm a cisgendered uh, a gay male of mixed race descent. Uh, my mom, late mother was South African. My father is um, Namibian, or as I would like to call him, a, a sperm donor. Um, um, I'm often privileged because I represent my gender identity and gender expression as uh, masculine, and so I can pass um, throughout the continent, throughout the world, because my gender identity documents um, and my gender identity and expression allow, uh, aligns uh, with these documentations. However, even in society where I sometimes pass uh, within the church space, um, I'm often below and outside, below because I'm a gay male, um, and outside because in 2015 when I came out, um, I decided um, as a gay man, um, I would rather um, resign. And within my church tradition, when you resign, you lose your status as a minister of the word and, and sacrament. My resignation was in solidarity for many other uh, LGBTQI plus people who couldn't uh, and still not in my church, the Uniting Reformed Church in Southern Africa, who has branches in Namibia, South Africa, and, and, and Lesotho, um, cannot join ordained ministry. So with that said, that is just a little bit about me and my positionality. I work for an organization called Inclusive and Affirming Ministries. Um, and as Prof. Lionel said, I work in the Faith Partnerships Program. Uh, I aim works towards the full recognition and celebration of and participation of LGBTQI plus people in faith communities across Africa. Um, and I am has um, was established in, in, in 1995. Uh, Masiwa Rakus Gunda, this Zimbabwean uh, theological scholar uh, in a paper called Silent No Longer made the following observation with regards to, to faith or religion in Southern Africa, and I quote, the greatest obstacle to the full acceptance of LGBTQI plus people in Southern Africa is religiously sanctioned homophobia. At Inclusive and Affirming Ministries, we can't um, um, narrate um, these religious homophobia um, through our theory of change, through opening minds, through diversity, um, awareness um, where we lobby to engage um, all people of faith to raise awareness of diversity regarding sexual orientation, gender identity, um, and then also expression and, and sex characteristics. But most importantly, um, on the outer rim of the opening minds raising awareness is that we have developed a toolkit reading together where we bring three three theoretical lenses together, um, our theory of action, and then also contextual uh, Bible study theory and um, intercultural Bible study, uh, um, study theory together in a process which we call reading together in order to assist religious um, homophobes um, to stop using the Bible as a sacred text to condemn LGBTQI people um, in Southern Africa, but also across um, Africa. And we also do this work um, when we do the sensitization processes of creating safe spaces um, for, for dialogue um, so that we can move towards empowering change agents uh, to take action um, within faith communities and also civil society. Another quote from Rakis Gunda when he speaks of how these attitudes of religious homophobia can, can change in this paper called Silent No Longer that was um, commissioned by the other foundation. Um, and I quote, attitudes at grassroots, especially inside the most 
homophobic churches and homophobic years and also an umbrella term for biphobic and for transphobic churches can only be changed through the work of activists and allies who all and allies who are known in respect of within local communities and congregations. We do this work through two part uh, through two programmatic uh, programs, our faith partnerships and our community partnerships. In our faith partnerships program, we work truly with um, in the long term in our hope and our dream is with restorative justice processes on your left. Um, developed and implemented between the churches and LGBTQI people. So it is a participatory restorative justice model and not where the church defines what justice ought to look like. And LGBTQI people um, are more accepted uh, by congregations. But in the medium term, we work more in, uh, towards inclusive and affirming uh, denominational church policies. Um, for example, the Dutch Reformed Church case that was recently won in 2019, inclusive and affirming ministries played an, an important um, role in, in, in that case. Um, and then in the short term, more inclusive and affirming theologies and readings of, of scriptures. We also work within universities um, where theological students are trained from various denominations across South Africa and Southern Africa. Uh, for example, it's Stellenbosch University, Faculty of Theology, uh, University of Natal, the School of um, uh, Religion, Philosophy and Classics, specifically the, with the uh, um, Gender, Religion and Health program, also with Seth Mukatini Methodist Seminary and also the College of Transfiguration. Um, we do this work because we firmly believe that it is possible for LGBTQI plus people to integrate their spirituality, sexuality and, and gender. In our second uh, program, our community partnerships, uh, we work much more closer with regional partners in eight uh, countries in Southern Africa, East Africa, and also in West Africa. Here we uh, move also to more, um, to more inclusive and affirming um, curricula um, across the board, especially uh, with our partners, um, because a lot of our partners does great work in reproductive health and human rights and so forth. But um, constantly there is a faith aspect and that is where we will come in and do sensitization process from a faith perspective. We also work not only within the Christian faith, but we also work with other um, religions and faith. Uh, for example, Islam, the Al Gurbak Foundation with Imam uh, Bukhshin Hendricks, and also Temple Israel, uh, the uh, progressive uh, Jewish um, synagogue in, in Greenpoint. And also, we work very, very closely uh, with the traditional healers. Um, within um, the larger Cape Town uh, community. Uh, this is our team um, from left is our administrator, um, Ebigal Irikom and Modern Newman Valentine, who is our regional partnerships coordinator um, under Marlo's leadership um, in 2018 to 2020. I am evaluated um, or form part of the Human Science Research Council to evaluate what the role of faith is, um, either as a um, as a deterrent or a or is faith a um, a uh, contributor, positive contributor for comprehensive sexual education in uh, Sadiq schools, um, and then in the middle uh, is Michelle Bonsai, our programs manager and our director, Ecclesia de Lange, and also my colleague, the um, Nokotula Mjwaha, who works in the civil society partnerships. And I think the guy on the right looks a little bit like me. Um, uh, I'm going to end it there because I don't want to take too much time. Our resources, um, our website is www.im.org.za. Um, you can email us at info at 
Uh, you can find us on Facebook. I am 587. We don't know where the 587 still comes from, but we're investigating. Um, and we're also on Instagram, on Twitter, and also on LinkedIn. On our website, you can find our, all our articles and all our resources um, in the faith partnerships programs, civil society programs, um, and also a little bit of, about our history are freely downloadable. Um, yeah, thank you very much to the coaches. Back to you. Thank you so much, Hanslin. I just want to start off by saying that your story of reclaiming your position in your religion was so refreshing. And in fact, your talk was of special interest to me because I just finished watching a Netflix documentary called Pray Away. And after learning about um, the Pray Away, the gay conversion therapy practices, I had so many questions because I refused to believe that any religion built on a foundation of um, unconditional love would have no place for LGBTQIA plus people. And so your talk just solidified that for me and added much clarity and hope that I needed. Um, so thank you for that. And I just want to, before we go into the questions, invite our speaker, Sharon Cox, who had a bit of an issue beforehand, um, if she could please take the stage. Okay, so I'm still having a bit of technical difficulties. So in the meantime, I actually had a question for you, Hanslin, if that's okay. okay. Yes, I'm listening. Um... Okay, so uh, as I said, I've just finished watching this like really topical documentary. So um, the idea of um, religion and um, being queer was in my head. So I thought it would be um, a good idea to speak to my queer friends who grew up in Christian households. And I found that a trend was that a lot of the queer community brought up in Christian households have now turned to atheism. Do you think that this is, um, I know it's a coping mechanism because of the bigotry that is perpetuated in Christian churches, some of them. So how do you think we can combat this? Do you think it's just something that is inevitable or is your organization um, trying to infiltrate the mainstream churches? How, how can we fix that? Because I know it's not everyone's first choice, but um, some people feel forced into atheism. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, two points. The one is on the conversion therapy. Um, two weeks ago, I was part of um, a group that studied um, the impact of conversion therapy in Nigeria, in South Africa, and also in, uh, in Kenya, um, and specifically looking um, at conversion therapy practices and the different nuanced ways that it is operating. Um, for example, traditionally, as you said about the Netflix documentary, Pray Away, um, there would be prayer and rituals, but we also know um, that conversion therapies, because it's a fake science, um, uh, forced marriages onto queer people or queer people into forced marriages also kind of forms part of, of, of these practices. Um, so thank you for, for picking that up. With a second remark with regards to your friends, but also to many queer Muslims and um, and other people from other uh, faiths that have sacred, uh, sacred texts. 
Um, a lot of times it is as um, a Prof Lionel said at the, at the, right at the beginning, is cisgendered males, um, white males and cisgendered males in general that interpret um, uh, sacred texts, but through, through um, feminist uh, interpretations of the Bible, of the Quran, of the Torah, and also of queer um, interpretations, we, we can scientifically prove that those texts that are normally used, for example, um, also in the Abrahamic faiths, Genesis 1 to 3, the creation story, um, um, Genesis 19, that we now know today can be read differently and affirmingly that um, that it opens a way and a pathway for queer people to connect the spirituality that plays such an important role to the uh, mental health and to the physical health that it is possible to read the Bible contextually and not literally. And a huge part of these literal interpretations of sacred texts has to do with patriarchy and when it comes to queer bodies, it has to do with yetru patriarchy and it becomes such an, the, a pervasive um, water that we actually swam in and that we drink of and that we are part of. And that's why at the beginning of my presentation, I position myself, as you said, of, of this is my story, this is my narrative, because a lot of times cisgendered males, they don't have to. Um, heterosexual males ha don't have to position this themselves because of the pervasiveness of heteropatriarchy that gives them all these priv privileges. So it is possible um, to read the Quran, to read the Bible, to read the Torah and many other sac sacred scriptures and also traditional cultures, traditional queer uh, healers have said there is other epistemologies and ontologies that we need to discover. Um, within a decolonial praxis. Thank you so much, Hanslan. I think you really spoke to the fact that it's all in translation and your interpretation. So um, with us changing the narrative and bold figures of um, white cisgendered, cisgendered males in the church, I think real change can happen and hopefully people wouldn't be forced into paths that they wouldn't prefer. So thank you for clarifying that and answering. And now I think Sharon Cox's presentation is ready. So Sharon, if you're ready, please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Oh my goodness, I got myself in an awful pickle. Do this all the time and now it just, I don't know, I did a whole presentation to myself. So I'm Sharon, I'm from Triangle Project. I'm the Health and Support Services Manager and deal with health both physically and emotionally. So, <coughs> excuse me. My presentation is a dash of pride with a large dose of prejudice um, and I'm speaking to hate crimes and victimization of LGBTQI plus people and the impact of victimization. So a lot of people, and I'm sure you are not amongst them, wonder why in a time such as this, when we have such a progressive uh, basket of of uh, frameworks, legal frameworks, do we still sit with such prejudice, such violence, such discrimination? And that is because paper rights and lived realities are far removed. So on the one side, we do sit with the Constitution, with a Bill of Rights, with Reputa, with a Victims Charter, with the Basapela Principles, and yet we still sit with murder, with rape, victimization and discrimination, with bullying, not just in schools, adults do it too, unnecessary surgeries performed, conversion therapies, um, and non-acceptance and rejection, to name but a few. So, having said that, we have David on the top left and Phoebe on the bottom right. David, a young gay man, Phoebe, a young trans woman, both in their mid twenties. They live 12 kilometers apart from one another, non-acceptance by families, but loved dearly by their friends, their logical families. 
um, their, their work colleagues, um, both leading productive lives. And on the right, that's where their lives ended and um, a sense of how their lives ended. What I want to point out to in these slides is that between these two crime scenes is that there are 14 perpetrators. Out of the 14 perpetrators, only one perpetrator is over the age of 18. They ranged in age from 10 to 18, with only one being 24. And so one begins to wonder, at which generation does this end? If this is where we're sitting now, with a generation this young perpetrating this kind of violence. And so we look at what are the drivers of intolerance and hate and prejudice? And here are the main ones. We need look no further then patriarchy, heteronormativity, and I just caught the, the end of my comrade, colleague, and friend, Hanslin. Patriarchy, heteronormativity, and the biggest ones, religion, culture, and tradition. You see, whatever your field is that you're going into, whatever your calling is, whatever your specialization is going to be. We are all told in training that you check yourself, that you examine your blind spots, that you leave these things at the door, but then you are leaving half of yourself behind. And that is not realistic. That does not happen. You are taking your whole self into that waiting room. You are taking your whole self into that ward. You are taking your whole self into that therapy room. You are taking your whole self into whatever setting you are finding yourself in. You are taking your prejudice, your intolerance, your, your, your dislike for some uh, grouping of people. You are taking it in with you. And let me tell you that there is none so perceptive as LGBTIQ plus people for that. We are very good at reading nonverbal cues. And so this causes great harm and has great impact on the people sitting in front of you. And this is some of the impact that it has. Depression, anxiety, dropping out of school, substance use, becoming unhoused, some people call it homeless, suicide ideation, suicide completion, self-loathing, internalized homophobia, biophobia, transphobia, intersex phobia, lack of self-care, we see um, foster children, young people in children's homes, young people raising themselves, seeing a young trans woman in a police cell, because from the age of, of 13, the parents thought that the way to deal with her identity and uh, since praying her right was not uh, doing the trick, the police would fetch her on just about a weekly basis. And there was nothing to charge her with, so she was just made to be uh, sat in the charge office all night and the next morning she could skedaddle back home. And I knew the day was coming when she would turn 18 and would be placed in a holding cell. And <coughs> that was exactly what happened. And the day she was placed in a holding cell, none of those legal frameworks made a bit of difference. She was placed in a holding cell with three grown males and raped throughout the night. And so it caused the depression, the anxiety, 
the dropping out of school because her friends continually saw her at the back of a police station. It led to the beginning of drug use, becoming unhoused for a period of time, suicide, ideation and attempts, self-loathing, all of these things. We also see living a lie versus living authentically an unwillingness, a deep unwillingness to access services because what we know about our siblings who are LGBTIQ+, is that in the health sector, for example, is that you, it is not uncommon, it is more common than you know, to be met with somebody else sitting on the other side who holds power if you are a nurse, if you are a doctor, if you are a therapist, you hold power. And it is not uncommon for my siblings to hear that who they are is not acceptable, that who they are is not right, that who they are is a sickness or a sin or a mental illness and who they are needs correcting or needs converting. And so an unwillingness to access service is often a first class ticket to death. And so I ask you as you journey out into the world in whichever field that you take, and that you make a life for yourself in that field. And hopefully it is a calling and not just a, um, a whatever. Um, that you do so with this in mind and that you treat each human in front of you as a, a human with a heart, a human that is as deserving as you are. That person may not be you. That person may not identify as you do. That person may be of a different identity, a different orientation, a different expression. But that person is as worthy as you are. And if you cannot help us, please don't harm us. Thank you very much. Wow, Sharon, thank you so much. I um, speak on behalf of everyone, I think, when I say that I just wish we could stream presentations like yours on Mnet every Sunday night so that everyone can just hear about real stories like this because it is through exposure to messages like yours that really just the seeds of change are planted. So thank you for making us face the uncomfortable truths. And thank you to all three of you powerhouses of change, Amelia, Hanslin, and Sharon. Your time here has been invaluable. It was planned um, that we would now open up the floor and offer an active time of engagement for our audience um, via Q&A chat. But due to time restraints and lost time due to technology, we might not be able to get through it all. So um, a plan would be made to answer all the questions. But I think we can take a few uh, before we have to leave at four. I think let's start off um, with a question for Amelia. And the question is, how do we help local clinics to be more friendly towards the LGBTQIA plus community, especially in rendering health access? This was a question from C4. All right. So for because um, clinics and look all the local clinics have a challenge of changing stuff all the time. The first thing that we need to do as communities is to sensitize our staff in all the clinics and also to make sure that we find a way to sustain of which we've tried. It's not possible to, to say if we train the 30 staff now, these are the people that will be attending um, to the LGBTQIA plus persons. But again, what we did in Cape Town, we have established the LGBTQIA plus forum where we have all the stakeholders that are working within our population to say, how do we coordinate ourselves so that our voices are heard and we are valued where we go. 
Um, so we need to find a way to influence uh, the policies and the authorities just to change because we already have clinics that are implementing the sensitized, the friendly services. Um, but we need now to hand over to the department as to say, this is what is working and how do we then move it further uh, to implement whatever services that we feel that we're comfortable with in all the clinics. For example, the locator form. If you go to the clinic, you are still asked if you are a female or male, and you will be asked why are you not um, on family planning if you are a female. So we need to change that. We need to change that mentality, but uh, I believe that we need to make sure that our authorities are informed first so that we don't lose um, the people that we should be counting in terms of our statistics right in the right boxes. Now everyone is between the female and male. Thank you. That's all I wanted to say in responding to the question. Thank you, Amelia. I definitely agree with you when you say that um, change dots at the roots and we have to first fix the, fix the problem of mentality. So thank you for that. And I think that's where um, student organizations like SCORA comes into play, where we're starting um, to train the minds of our future healthcare professionals um, from university. So thank you. Um, another question we have is for Hanslin, and that is, how is the relationship with the faith-based organization in supporting the LGBTQIA plus community, especially on a psychological support? Thank you so much for, for the question. Um, the Psychology Association of South Africa has very clear guidelines. Um, so that is one great effort from a religious point of view. Um, as I said earlier on, a lot of uh, our work is centered in university training centers for future ministers so that we can already target them um, through sensitization processes when they give pastoral key and support to um, LGBTQI plus people. We are in the process um, of working on a, a pastoral uh, key uh, sort of toolkit um, for in this an African context. It is a slow in a daunting process and hopefully we will get more stakeholders and partners onto the project in order to complete the project because it cannot only be in English. It needs to be in all the language uh, languages of, of all South Africans in order to make it um, um, accessible. Um, so there has been great efforts by um, the medical um, and ally health um, uh, um, societies and communities in order to, to protect LGBTQI people and not to infringe um, on, the, on the basic human, human rights uh, to get fair and equal treatment. Um, yeah. Thank you, Hanslin. Um, I think that really speaks to the, the topical phenomenon of mental health that's just really ravishing the adolescent population, especially in the queer community. So psychological effects are something we really need to take into account. So thank you for that. Um, I think it is now appropriate to hand back to Professor Lionel just for his closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Janara, for um, it's been an incredible hour for me. Um, and I'm realizing now we can't do these things properly in an hour. But it represents for me the start of a conversation. I, I want to say to, to the speakers this afternoon, Janara, thank you very much. And thank you for responding at such short notice. And really, I think you've imbued this afternoon with an incredible spirit of openness and inquiry. So thank you very, very much for your moderation of the questions. And I, I probably will, will, will say thanks first and then make a couple of remarks. Um, I, I want to say to Amelia, I'm not sure if she's left already, but thank you very much for that reflection on 
on important work that's happening in a space that we often marginalize, uh, both in the thinking, but I think it's a growing space now in, in, in health professional science, and I think that's important. Sharon, I think your, 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 how can I say, the stars aligned in this place of the stars to put your talk at the end, because in many ways, the weight of what you had to tell us is the thing we need to take away from the conversation today. And as you spoke, I was reminded of in the 80s, the, um, the detainees parent support committee, which was the group that used to support people who were detained without trial in the 1980s, uh, published a book, Now Everyone is Afraid. And, and, and the, the slogan at the beginning of the book was, if they don't know, how will they feel? And if they don't feel, how will they act? And if they don't act, how will we change our world? That last sentence is an addition of mine, but I really want to take what you've said today and, and, and move forward with that because I think that's the challenge. Um, it's the challenge of, of hearing the authentic stories and the extent to which it is human people who are the barriers to the authentic lives of human people. These are not always big things, but they're, they're, they're big questions for us to continue to ask. So colleagues, this is the launch, the, the starting point of our month, um, of our month of, of, of Pride Reflections and a range of activities. And, and to those of you who are online, I hope that you've got a, a, a full program in hand. The, the, the month will close with the reflection at the end of the month on higher education and the issues around LGBTQI a plus inclusions in that curriculum and reflections in that curriculum and in the spaces we occupy as health professionals. So colleagues, it remains for me to say in, in the language of those first peoples when they said thank you uh, very, very much, they said kaisi kai ganglands. And so I'm deeply grateful for the time we've spent together. Thank you. And I'm not still not off yet, I hope. And thank you to the team.